Hey, y'all, Scott Horton here for WallStreetWindow.com. Mike Swanson knows his stuff. He made a killing running his own hedge fund and always gets out of the stock market before the government-generated bubbles pop, which is, by the way, what he's doing right now, selling all his stocks and betting on gold and commodities. Sign up at WallStreetWindow.com and get real-time updates from Mike on all his market moves. It's hard to know how to protect your savings and earn a good return in an economy like this. Mike Swanson can help. Follow along on paper and see for yourself. WallStreetWindow.com Hey, you own a business? Maybe we should consider advertising on the show. See if we can make a little bit of money. My email address is scott at scotthorton.org. All right, y'all, Scott Horton Show. Check out the archives at scotthorton.org. 4,000-something interviews going back to 2003 there. And sign up for the podcast feed as well there, uh, scotthorton.org. Follow me on Twitter, at Scott Horton Show. All right, introducing Brian Sonnenstein. He's a writer for shadowproof.com which uh, formerly was Firedog Lake. It's now Shadowproof. Uh, Kevin Gostola, another great writer, is over there. Um, this one is called, well, there's a couple here, quite a few. Resistance continues as historic prison strike enters fourth week. Oh, that's like a week old. Um, and then this one is how some prisons swiftly moved to undermine national prison strike. Welcome to the show. How are you doing, Brian? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Uh, very happy to have you here. I appreciate you joining us today. And um, I guess I'll go ahead and plead guilty. I have not been keeping up with this story like I should have been at all. So I'll ask you to tell us everything. Go ahead. <laughs> all right. Well, I'll, I'll do my best. So uh, basically, um, you know, over the past few years, especially, there have been, uh, as you know, a lot of reports about uh, abhorrent conditions uh, related to mass incarceration. You have a lot of overcrowding. Um, you have a lot of abuse of prisoners going on, and relevant to that, there have been a lot of uprisings and riots going on around the country that people may or may not have heard about. Um, so just to put that out there first, uh, the September 9th labor strike is not exactly something new, um, but it is sort of a uh, coalescence of all of these actions together as one movement. Um, so basically, you had these prisoners uh, who are calling attention to specifically uh, their treatment uh, in the, as a labor force. You know, they're paid next to nothing, if anything at all. They work in slave conditions. Uh, you know, they don't have the same protections as workers do on the outside from being injured or working in dangerous jobs. Um, and they manufacture all sorts of things that you and I probably use on a daily basis, uh, from furniture, uh, you know, clothing, anything like that. They do call center work. Um and uh, so they put out a call to action, the Free Alabama Movement, and uh, which is a group of prisoners and their family members and their supporters in Alabama around Pullman Detention Center specifically, as well as uh, Donaldson. Um, and they were also joined by prisoners in Texas uh, who have been calling attention to their treatment, the farm labor that they have to deal with out there. Um, and starting on September 9th, uh, you had prisoners, either entire units or just even individuals or small groups of prisoners, doing whatever they can to resist uh, resist their work assignments or go on hunger strike um, and begin to demand better treatment. Um, so that is sort of, uh, you know, a 30,000-foot view mm -hmm. um, of, of how we got here. Cool. And then it, you say it started uh, second week of September? That's right. Uh, you know, the official sort of call to action was set for September 9th, which is the 45th anniversary of the rebellion at Attica. Ah. Uh, Nelson Rockefeller slaughter there, yeah. Uh, okay, right. so um, I want to go back to, uh, well, first of all, the state. So it's just in Alabama and Texas so far? No, actually, it's, it's uh, been in... Well, you know, part of the problem, and I'll preface this, is, is that uh, because prisons are very secretive places and because, uh, you know, both officials don't like to give out information, but it's also hard for, for prisoners to maintain uh, open communication with people on the outside, it's hard to know exactly how many states and how many facilities and how many prisoners have gone on strike. But it's actually spread, uh, you know, some counts have put it around 11 or 12 states. Uh, some have put it up near the 20s, 25. 
Um, I've seen counts of about 40 to 50 facilities uh, engaging in some kind of action, Mm -hmm. and it's happening all over the country. It's happening in Washington, uh, Virginia, California, Texas, um, and all different states. Yeah. Well, you know, um, as you may be aware, Adam Johnson at Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting has been really focusing on the dog that didn't bark here. Uh, specifically right. MSNBC, who runs basically prison porn all weekend long, uh, you know, how bad we need them and that kind of thing. And then when it comes to a major story like this, I don't know if now they've corrected it all, but they went for at least a few weeks there without even mentioning it. Yeah, and I think Adam is completely right. I believe he said that MSNBC has a unique obligation to cover these strikes. Right, given yeah, the way absolutely. That they have, you know, as you said, sort of given this pornographic view of uh, prison life in America. And, you know, I think I totally agree with that. And I think there's sort of this perception that people have about, you know, who's in prison, why they're there, and how things are, and who's responsible for the conditions there. Right. And I think MSNBC plays a big role in perpetuating that myth. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not just them. I mean, uh, they're probably the most, as you're, as, uh, you're saying, quoting him there about they're the most responsible. They they owe us coverage of this more than anyone else. But really, every major media outlet in America ought to be covering this. And uh, it's really been buried. And I wonder, especially, you know, as we're reading all these emails and some of this inside baseball stuff from these politicians, it makes me really uh, wonder. It's quite easy for me to imagine that emails have gone out from people in the federal government to friends in the media saying, hey, we want to play this down because this could get way out of hand here, you know? Well, you know, that's definitely the tactic that's been taking place in the facilities. Uh, I mean, you know, part of the reason why we're only just learning, you know, now over a month out from the start of the strike about things that happened in the first few days is because prison officials reacted very quickly in a lot of cases, uh, you know, putting prisoners in isolation, cutting off their communication with the outside world, transferring them to different facilities. Um, you know, you name it, you know, uh, there's been reports of prisoners getting beaten up and tear gas. Um, so, you know, it's not, you know, it's not that surprising, but at the same time, you know, I think there's, there is a disconnect, uh, in the major media between what's happening on the ground in a lot of these communities and sort of what ends up in their news. And I think this is a, a place where it becomes very obvious because, you need to have contact with these communities and these people who are who are struggling. Right, yeah. Well, yeah, they put them out there in the country, and very quickly uh, rural communities become very dependent on the jobs, and every, everything's far removed from the voting populations of the states. They don't have to look, ab- look at it or think about it. They don't know anybody who even works at a prison. It's all miles and miles out in the country somewhere, you know, for the most part, and uh, far removed. It's almost like the wars, you know, where millions of soldiers right. have, have fought in the wars over the last 15 years, and yet it's still a very small percentage of the population. A lot of us, a lot of people anyway, not us, but a lot of people right. anyway can can go quite a long time without any association with anybody who, who's been to the wars or knows anything about them at all. It's just very well, far it's removed. It's becoming a lot harder to do that, though, because, you know, at this point with our prison population reaching 2 million people behind bars, you know, both on the federal and state level, uh, you know, something like one in three Americans has a criminal record. Um, I think it's getting to the point where, you know, somebody knows somebody or at least knows somebody else who has a criminal record has had an experience with incarceration. And to your point, just quickly about about the jobs uh, in these communities that rely on it, that's totally correct. But I, I think something that is missing from these conversations a lot is that for the people who work in these jobs, this is not, these are not great job opportunities. No. These are, you know, especially in a place like Alabama, uh, which I've written a little, a little bit about, you have guards going on strike as well, um, you know, for different reasons than the prisoners. But, uh, you know, these jobs that, that they have are very underpaid. Um, they're extremely long hours, lots of pressure. You're dealing with populations that have disproportionate uh, numbers of people with uh, mental illness compared to people on the outside, substance abuse, um, and there is no programming or there is no uh, support system on the inside for those people. So you really are trying to keep the lid on a powder keg and you're getting no, uh, you know, sort of support from, you know, your, your administrators or even politicians 
um, who are out there sort of taking advantage of this newfound interest in criminal justice reform. Mm -hmm. um, so really nobody, no, you know, nobody is benefiting except for those who, who stand to gain from the bottom line. Yep. Well, and yeah, you're right, too, about, you know, when you said uh, about MSNBC, how they help perpetuate the mythology of all, you know, very hardened criminals behind those bars when really it's a lot of regular people. I just read a quote the other day of a lady who was in jail for helping arrange a crack sale, some low level, nothing that mm -hmm. any, any and everybody would have forgotten about in two days if they'd just been left alone. But anyway, she's doing hard time, decades in federal prison. And, and the quote was, I was really surprised by how many other people just like me are in here, meaning normal, regular, everyday people who aren't criminals at all, but who did a drug deal and got nailed by the feds to the wall on, you know, mandatory minimum time, this kind of thing. And of course, there are many more like that in the state prisons, but they're just regular people. That's who they are. And, and it is a big mythology. Of course, the, the stories in the post today about there are more pot busts in America for just low level possession, never mind trading in it, just low level possession than all violent crime arrests combined. Uh, that's how yeah, far out of proportion exactly. this is. So, yeah, this is not, you know, the other. We we shouldn't let MSNBC convince us that these are enemy aliens on these islands within our country somewhere. These really are, as you're saying, these are friends and neighbors. We know people in there who just got out, you know. All of us do. Right. I think I think we take for granted how much we are still dealing with the lingering effects of the super predator uh, era era, you know, where where we were told uh, day in and day out by people in the media and in our government that the people that were being locked up and put behind bars were these monsters. Um, and I think people really take for granted that it really could be it could be you. It could be your brother or your sister. It could be really anybody uh, who gets ensnared in this system. Um, and most often than not, it's people who can't, you know, afford a good attorney or can't afford bail um, and, you know, accept plea, uh, plea bargains instead of taking their, their cases to court. You know, if, if everybody who had charges brought against them went to trial, the entire system would shut down. Right. So it really is. Uh, it's just so it's just a vacuum into a warehouse is really what it is. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So now let's talk a little bit about uh, what they're uh, making. And again, back to the imagination, I'm just picturing from Superman 2, where they're all in there making license plates and doing laundry or whatever, right? And uh, uh, I think that's what people, you know, mostly imagine is, well, somebody's got to make the license plates, right? A state-provided good, quote-unquote, something. It's just a big mm -hmm. metal tax stamp, really. But anyway, uh, somebody's got to make those, right? And so maybe if they're doing farm work, okay, these are vegetables for the government school lunches, something like that. That's at least probably what people imagine uh, is the labor being done in there. And yet uh, you described a reality that's quite different, only you didn't. You were just, again, uh, kind of given the thumbnail sketch there. But I, I'd like for you to elaborate about that, if you could, about what kind of work these people are doing. And especially you mentioned they're being mm -hmm. put in, in dangerous situations that free laborers on the outside would not be put in, and that kind of thing, too. Right. So there's basically two kinds of labor, I guess. There's uh, labor that is related to the function of the prison. So you're talking about laundry, kitchen work, uh, you know, working in the legal library, things like that. And then you have uh, sort of these private prison industries, um, which are companies who are essentially leasing out uh, prisoners for their labor for pennies on the dollar. And again, if, if anything at all, because a lot of these prisoners are forced to work, uh, you know, if they don't work, they'll be thrown in the hole, be, uh, which is solitary confinement, or they'll be punished some other way. Um, you know, if they, if they don't work, then they lose out on getting something called good time credit, which is having uh, days removed from your sentence so you can get a slightly earlier release. So there's all this, this sort of coercion. But um, in terms of the actual labor, labor itself, um, you know, it's, it's especially insidious because the, the products that you buy that are made by prisoners are not labeled made by prisoners. They're, made, they're labeled made in America. And for people, especially after the financial crisis, uh, who are wary of supporting companies that manufacture goods in other countries, um, they might go and buy something uh, that's labeled made in America, thinking that they're doing a good thing, when really they're, they're basically uh, buying something that was made with slave labor. Um, and so you have products 
again, like American flags, uh, furniture, um, clothing for, uh, you know, a lot of these companies. Um, and in terms of the farm labor, you know, for instance, in, in one of my articles, I spoke to somebody who was talking about how they have, uh, you know, people working around, uh, you know, operating heavy machinery with standing water on the ground. And nobody's coming to fix that. You can't, you can't sue your employer over that. There's no workers' compensation. You know, if you get hurt, uh, you get hurt. And let me tell you, the medical care in prison is almost non-existent, and that is not going to stop them from telling you to report to work again. Um, so, you know, it really is uh, sort of the next iteration of convict leasing, the next iteration of slavery. It's just sort of continued to snowball in this direction, and this is where we are today. These things are not uh, un- disconnected. Right. Well, and, you know, people, it's funny, um, I think people actually did sort of mean well in uh, the 19, maybe in the 80s and and in the 90s when economist types were recommending that, yeah, you should privatize these prisons. But, of course, that doesn't really mean, well, there's kind of two kinds of privatize, right? There's having the government stop, do something and just having the market do it or businesses do it. And then there's a government contract to a private business to carry out a state function, and in this mm-hmm. case, state power, that no other private corporation is allowed to kidnap and imprison people, right? They have a very special license from these states to do this. And it probably makes sense if what you're interested in is the state budget in the short term, that, yeah, we're going to save 10% over, you know, government, uh, good enough for government work or whatever. But then... It complete. It was, and I, I really, you know, I actually know somebody who wrote a thing like this back in the '90s about how this just makes good sense. And they completely ignored and admit now, ignored the fact that you're now giving these companies an interest in lobbying to pass more and more and more laws and create more and more excuses for people to be jailed just to keep their prisons full. And it sounds like the kind of thing that you might warn, but. Then it's actually true. You can find it in the news where the private prison corporations lobby for drug laws. And you could see the same thing with them loosening. And I don't know what the restrictions ever were. I mean, you mentioned this is the reiteration of old convict leasing from Jim Crow eras and whatever. I don't know how good it ever got. Maybe my imagination that all they ever were making was were uh, license plates for a while there was, you know, kind of always, you know, not the case. But at, at this point, you have more and more companies, including major corporations, right? You mentioned call centers and stuff like that. You have major corporations who are saving maybe millions or even billions of dollars on labor that they'd be happy to invest a small percentage of that in lobbying to keep pot illegal, to keep sentences high, to, to do anything they can to keep more people in prison so that their golden goose doesn't get slaughtered. And at the and expense I, of the rest of us. And it's the kind of thing where just a little bit of imagination could have predicted that this could be a real problem, you know? And here we exactly. are. As you said, this is where we've ended up now that we live here in the future in the 20 teens. This is where we are. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and I think that is an incredibly important point, uh, especially in this moment where we have sort of this historic uh interest in criminal justice reform at the federal and state level. Um, traditionally, I mean, the history of, of justice reform, and this includes going back to slavery and emancipation, is sort of a tinkering reform. I mean, these things, uh, they, the, the changes that have been made may address whatever the, the most pressing issue is of that moment, but nobody seems to really be thinking two steps ahead. And the fact of the matter is these companies uh, whose bottom lines depend on it, have already thought three or four steps ahead. So with regards to you know prison privatization and mass incarceration, um, a lot of these companies have already, they see the writing on the wall. You know, they, they see that, uh, you know, facility management, uh, you know, companies like CCA and GeoGroup, they know where the wind is blowing and they know that, you know, the, you know millennials, for instance, are probably not going to tolerate having uh, private prisons in government when they come to power. However, um, that is why they have begun to spend all their money acquiring post-release services, uh, you know, drug treatment, rehabilitation, um, and, uh, you know, um, like the ankle monitoring, things like that. Um, and it's not because of the kindness of their heart. It's because it's still a captive market. You know, what is the difference 
if you have uh, if you're making a buck off of somebody who's you know behind bars or if they're you know stuck in their house with an ankle monitor and you're getting paid you know some rental fee for the monitor, some thousands of dollars that the prisoner has to pay uh, to to stay in so-called community corrections. Mm-hmm. Um, so you know, I I guess I would encourage people, uh, you know, when they're thinking about criminal justice reform and prison reform, you know, the tinkering and the and the just sort of blunting the hard edges of incarceration that we have done for decades in this country is exactly how we got here. And without some more imagination, like you say, um, you know, we're never going to break the cycle and it will just be some other iteration of the same horrors. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm glad I'm really glad that you brought up the oppression of probation and parole. I've been very mm-hmm. lucky. I will, I will be the first to say lucky compared to so many of my friends who've been caught up in at least that. You know, I guess a lot of my friends have been to jail from time to time mm-hmm. or whatever. But um, the the oppression of probation, I mean, the whole thing is just set up to fail, to make you fail, to make you late, to make you in trouble, to get you revoked. And all the fines and fees, especially if you're talking about poor people, and they got to come up with hundreds of dollars a month, as you said, to pay the lease on their own ankle bracelet or whatever the latest racket is, um, you know, that is electronic monitor, uh, this kind of thing. Uh, you know, I've known people who got busted with drugs who could have gone, uh, one guy specifically I'm thinking of, who could have gone to jail for two years, and he ended up going to jail for probably a total of five years plus years worth of probation because he kept getting revoked over and over, let out and revoked and whatever, all this time over a little bit of drugs because the whole thing is just made to trap you. And um, and there are millions when people say two million people in prison, they leave out and another yep. five million on parole or probation, which is the same damn thing, basically. It's horrible. No, it's it's a system of totalitarianism. True. It's like living in East Germany or something. If it, if it's happening to you, that's how bad it is. You know. Yeah, I mean, we need to remember that. Uh, you know, the the way that that we can look at this is that. Uh, you know, we can let more people out on parole and probation, but if we're setting them up to fail, um, then they're really then you know you have to question the the, the uh, value of what you're doing. Um, you know, a lot of these people again. People who are incarcerated disproportionately uh, in the lower income brackets, they suffer from mental illness, substance abuse. They're victims of trauma themselves. I mean, people who, who commit murder or sexual assault, you know, a lot of times those people are, have been victims of violence and childhood abuse themselves. And, you know, are, uh, are what we typically do in this country is we see the crime that they did or were alleged to commit. And our goal is to punish them for that for some reason because we we think that that will turn them around. And really, you know, I think if you gave people the support that they need, or or maybe even if you had provided the services in the community that led them, uh, that the absence of which led them to commit crimes for survival, uh, you know, you probably wouldn't have most of these people in these situations anyway. If yeah. there was really job training, access to food, education. Um, you know, health care is a huge one. I mean, we have just completely dismantled uh, public health care on the outside. And we are currently, and especially, as, and again, as part of this prison reform movement, we are building public health inside of prisons or in, in punitive environments where it's not, uh, you know, where your patient doesn't have a trusting relationship with the person treating them, it's a relationship of force. And you cannot, you know, you can ask any mental health professional. You cannot have progress with a patient who cannot trust their doctor, whose yeah. doctor gets to go home at the end of the night and, you know, lock the door behind them. Um, it's just, it doesn't make sense, and it's completely outdated. You hate government? One of them libertarian types? Or maybe you just can't stand the president, gun grabbers, or warmongers? Me too. That's why I invented LibertyStickers.com. Well, Rick owns it now, and I didn't make up all of them, but still, if you're driving around and want to tell everyone else how wrong their politics are, there's only one place to go. LibertyStickers.com has got your bumper covered. Left, right, libertarian, empire, police, state, founders, quote, central banking. Yes, bumper stickers about central banking. Lots of them. And, well, everything that matters. LibertyStickers.com. Everyone else's stickers suck. Hey, I'll Scott here. 
Ever wanted to help support the show and own silver at the same time? Well, a friend of mine, libertarian activist Arlo Pignati, has invented the alternative currency with the most promise of them all. QR Silver Commodity Discs. The first ever QR code one ounce silver pieces. Just scan the back of one with your phone and get the instant spot price. They're perfect for saving or spending at the market. And anyone who donates $100 or more to the Scott Horton Show at scotthorton.org slash donate gets one. That's scotthorton.org slash donate. And if you'd like to learn and order more, send them a message at commoditydiscs.com or check them out on Facebook at slash commoditydiscs. And thanks. Yeah. Well, now I come at this from the entire other point of view. I don't want any government services at all. I think these same victims would just be a hell of a lot better off if the government would just leave them alone. Uh, here to help is usually not much better than here to simply kidnap and extort you, uh, you know, in reality. And that's really, isn't that a big part of why we're stuck with these cops is because this is the enforcement arm of the state. This is how they get business done. This is how they pay for all those services is they fine and fee and tax and harass the poor and the working classes out of all their money. The, the people with money can afford a lawyer and fight back a little bit, you know. Uh, that, this is how they raise their revenue. So, But anyway, the point really being is, you know, where we come together and agree is that um, people are it's a it's a war. Basically, uh, the people of this country, uh, huge segments of them of all different races and, and really different classes, too, um, are being absolutely exploited and really, in many cases, outright enslaved. As you're writing about in here, they don't have a choice. Or you go to solitary confinement. Well, geez, that's torture, according to yeah. all the human rights groups. I mean, except when Amnesty International is trying to lie us into a war. The rest of the time, they're saying it's torture to put somebody in solitary confinement. Right. Um, and uh, and so that's no choice at all. It is outright slavery, and it's something that just doesn't get talked about, is, and or, or it hasn't been. So, but this is the final question. Then the most important one is: so, what level of success has been gained here? Because an interview about it on my show is hardly a thing at all. Um, has anybody important taken note? Is there is there some kind of momentum or change or anything that can be pointed to so far with this most recent uh, strike against prison labor by uh, prison labor? You no, know, it's hard to say. Uh, you know, again, getting back to the question of what exactly is a real valuable response. I mean, uh, to give you an example, you know, sort of an illustrative example, uh, in Kinross Correctional Facility up in Michigan, you had uh, about 100 prisoners, I believe, went on a peaceful march in their yard as part of the the day after the strike began. And the deputy wardens came out and they spoke to them and the prisoners, uh, you know, told them all their grievances, the deputies listened, they, they even allegedly told the prisoners that they would take their concerns to the legislators, to legislators. they were going to work with them, they understood their problems. Uh, the deputies left the yard, and in came the, the troopers, firing tear gas and rubber bullets at the prisoners, uh, beating them, macing them, uh, and putting them into solitary confinement. And I think that that is sort of, uh, you know, you can extrapolate that to a larger degree about whether or not people in power are really listening. And I think at the end of the day, um, at least at this moment, uh, it's almost more important that we in the public uh, are waking up to these realities because, uh, you know, politicians are not leaders, they're followers. You know, they, it is the public that needs to learn about this and needs to bring these issues to the forefront and then force politicians to act, because we cannot just sit idly by and hope that the politicians come out, come out, you know, to their senses and say, this is morally abhorrent and I'm going to do something about it. No, they really need to be forced to act, and the question is, how far are we going to push them? Are we going to push them just to put band-aids on the situation or to sort of rethink the system that we're in? Um, so in terms of, you know, whether people are waking up to it, it's hard to say. It's still too early. You know, I'm sure that there have been... Uh, politicians and people in power who have acknowledged the strike. Um, but, you know, as far as I, I see, I don't see any real tangible reform taking place yet. Um, but again, this is a movement. It takes time. And, I, you know, I've been writing about prisons for years, and this is, you know, one of the few instances where I really feel like there are a lot of people who are like, you know, I've never, I had no idea this was going on. 
you know, and I had no idea. And, and it sparked an interest, I think, and especially, uh, you know, I don't know if you've seen uh, Ava DuVernay's documentary that just came out 13th. Um, it's also very popular right now. What's I it called? It's called 13th, referring to the 13th Amendment. Oh, okay. Um, I, I highly recommend it. It's, it's very succinct and sort of ties all of these um, all of these issues together. Um, that's so, yeah. the that's the amendment that outlawed private chattel slavery, but legalized government prison slavery, and then, as we've been discussing, government licensed private <laughs> slavery of convicts. Right, and that and that's in the Constitution, and so right. I mean that is a huge challenge. That is no, that's not going to be easy to fix, and I think that is something that we need to remember. Like these small reforms, these criminal justice bipartisan mandatory minimum reform bills, which, mm. by the way... You and know, which, the, by the way, actually, I, I really said that wrong, though. It doesn't expressly legalize that. It allows it, but it's not... Uh, it doesn't make it... The, the 13th Amendment doesn't make it federal law that uh, that labor is allowed, whatever, whatever. It just doesn't strike down and prevent the federal government or the state governments from doing such things. So, it creates the space for it. Right, yeah, exactly. But so if we so, could pass a state law in Georgia that forbid this thing, it's not like the the uh, government's appeal uh, you know, to the court against it would be that, well, the 13th Amendment says we have to have this or something like that. Right. That, that's an entirely different thing. I just didn't want to overstate it because I think I did. No, it's, it's for sure. And, you know, I do think just quickly, I think, uh, you know, some of the reforms that have been happening at the federal level are are – they're they're good. There are good steps in the right direction, and they're not enough. But I think people, uh, you know, the majority of people who are incarcerated are on the state level. Um, but the federal government, in a lot of cases, especially around corrections and public safety and law enforcement, sets the tone for what happens around the rest of the country. So mm-hmm. I think it's equally as important that people are paying attention to what's going on in their state governments as well as their county, their county and local governments, because I'll tell you. Uh, county jails, um, not prisons. These are people who are, you know, haven't been convicted of crimes yet and are locked in county jails for years. Um, you know, those are some of the most dangerous and inhumane places that you can imagine. That you know, people, uh, you know, the majority of deaths that happen behind bars are in county jails and within the first seven days of incarceration. So, um, so I think you know, it's equally important to know what's going on at your local level know what's going on in your state and to apply pressure there but to remember that the federal government is going to play an important role in setting the tone for what happens in the rest of the country and where they fall short are are going to be places where states and governments take advantage of these spaces to continue doing what they're doing Mm -hmm. well let me ask you to follow up a little bit about what you just said about people dying in local jail that's regular people being thrown in the cage with murderers basically over a, a traffic offense or something yeah, I mean, you know, you, you have a broken taillight, you, uh, I mean, anything, you, you're going to get arrested and you're going to go down to the precinct and they're going to put you in county jail, uh, you're going to wait for your court appearance, um, you know, you get your public defender, this is all pre-trial. These are people, you know, Rikers Island is a jail. People, I know people think it's like a prison, but in New York City, Rikers Island is a jail. Most people who are there have not been convicted of a crime. And these are people who are waiting to go to trial against, you know, super backlogged court cases. And again, the vast majority of these people have have serious medical needs. They have mental illness. They have, uh, you know, all sorts of needs. And these jails are incredibly overcrowded. They have no services, mostly because the inmate population turns over so quickly. It's not like a prison where you're going to be there for 10 years. Um, they just can't support this number of people with this amount of need. Um, and so people die. I mean, I write, I write about this all the time. People die of gangrene. They die from not getting their insulin. They die from having asthma attacks. Um, you know, it's like absolutely preventable and treatable things, um, but there just is not that service or that interest in providing care in a jail because it's costly and, you know, just without jumping all over the place too much, get back to this general posture of punishment, uh, you know, even in a jail setting where you haven't even been convicted of a crime, if you're in there complaining about a medical issue you might have, 
they're, you know, they're going to, their first reaction is going to be to treat it with skepticism, you know, because you're an offender. You're in the jail. Are you making up these claims and illnesses that you have to get preferable treatment? This is known as malingering. Um, and this is how people die. Yeah. And, yeah. and I'll just add, mm. Go ahead. to tie into the, the prison privatization, um, you know, not to take our eyes off the ball, because, uh, again, while while private prisons are moving, are becoming less popular, the actual facility management, there, especially on the county level, you have facilities that are privatizing services like medical care, like, like phone, visitation, email, um, and that stuff is just as pernicious, and it's harder to see because it's not a private company operating an entire facility. Mm-hmm. Um, so, there, you know, there's money being made there off of the the lives of prisoners. Right. Yeah, very effective rent sinking. And, yeah, and, and you know, I don't want to make uh, – I wouldn't want any of this to sound like the problem is just in the private prisons or just in the public ones because they both have deals uh, all across the country with these corporations, uh, outside corporations, to provide this labor, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Man. Well, um, listen, I can't remember what my last awesome question – oh, yeah, I can. Um, all right, so now here's something that's really important, too, and it's the subject of your piece here, actually, uh, at shadowproof.com, how some prisons swiftly move to undermine the national prison strike. And this is the part that I think is really important, that people understand that, you know, in order to bring this to our attention, people had to make real sacrifices. Uh, and, and, of course, the prison officials, they don't take too kindly to stuff like this at all, huh? No, not at all. I mean, I think, uh, you know, as I was saying at the very at the top of this conversation, um, the reaction was to swiftly break up prisoners, uh, to throw them in solitary confinement, um, to and especially to limit their access to communication with the outside world. Uh, You know, if you know, especially if you're somebody who's interested in supporting these prisoners, the most important thing that we can do in the public is to to put our eyes on these prisons because the reason, one of the reasons why they've been allowed to get away with all this stuff and one of the reasons why we don't really know the full extent of the, the labor strike um, is because of the, the secrecy. You know, it's just this information is very hard to come by. And let me tell you, as a journalist, it is very frustrating to try to cover this beat because, uh, you know, it's, it's just not like anything else where you're able to place a phone call or get an email um, you know, you're just jumping through hoops. And so uh, it's, it's just very hard to get this information out to the public. But if the public is paying attention, if they're making phone calls, if they're talking to their legislators about this, um, if prison officials know that they are being watched, they have a disincentive to, be, to continue to retaliate and clamp down on these prisoners. Um, it is when they know nobody is watching that they are comfortable to do whatever it is they want. Yep. Well, and that sort of goes back to what I was saying about my libertarianism here. I sort of have a fantasy that if maybe government's only job was the court system, then maybe the democracy would be able to handle it. And actually the the people would be that final check and balance on their state government and how it works. Because I think, I mean, I certainly, and this is, I think part of the reason why I'm always uh, hell bent on this subject, Brian, is because I was raised on Matlock. I love Matlock. And on Matlock, the trial is fair. And if you did it, man, you're going to the pen. But if you didn't do it, then the prosecutor is more than happy to fess up and say, ah, geez, I guess we got this one wrong. Judge, we want to dismiss the charges and set this man free. And, you know, we all read the Bill of Rights and we learn in fourth grade about how you get to cross-examine your witnesses and this kind of thing. It all sounds very fair and people take it all very for granted that it's a it's all a very self-correcting system. And, you know, part of my yeah, argument is happen. government is doing so <laughs> many things that the people can't keep control of it at all. It's all, as you've been describing this whole time, it's all rent seeking by special interests. You know, some guy comes up with a company, a, a way to charge prisoners to send emails every once in a while or whatever the racket is. Um, and everything's yeah, I mean, a political you, you, football instead of the high-minded citizens of Athens doing the right thing because of how important it is. Yeah, so few 
uh, of people behind bars have that opportunity to go and have sort of the fair trial that you saw on Matlock. Again, almost nobody goes to trial. Um, and the judge isn't the, the most powerful person in the courtroom. It is the prosecutor. Um, the, the system is so lopsided and so geared towards punishment um, that, again, you know, a lot of formerly incarcerated people that I talk to, they remind me that the system is not broken. It is working very efficiently. This is what it is designed to do. Yeah. Oh, see, that's the scary part, right? It took them forever to finally refine it. But this is, in essence, uh, you know, the thing finally uh, boiled to perfection there. They finally got it right. How to lock up the entire population. And, of course, this morning, was it this morning or last night? It's in the email, uh, on Twitter about the, the jury in Albuquerque where the cops murdered the homeless guy on, on video on, uh, who was camping out on that hillside there. Uh, where it was a hung jury, and where you know yeah. one in a million cases where the prosecutor would actually bring a case against a killer cop or two, and you can't get it by the citizens of the county to hold them responsible yeah. for it. Yeah, <laughs> it's really something. Anyway, there's a lot of work to be done. I mean, it, there is no one bill, uh, there is no one piece of legislation, not a speech, not not even a change in our attitude. It's, it's going to take a lot of work because this system, you know, as you said, is not just the two million people behind bars, but it's also the five million people uh, under supervision. Um, this system has spread its tentacles out in so many directions, um, and you know, it, it, even bringing in. So the loss of the disenfranchisement, your inability to vote, your inability to get a job, to get, uh, you know, access to affordable housing um, after you're left out of, after you're, you're released from prison. Uh, you know, we, we need to question what it is that we want to happen to people who run afoul of the law. You know, our, is our goal to dispose of them completely and just hope that uh, society takes care of itself? Because that doesn't seem to be working right yeah that's the thing is uh the assumption that everything is working to protect the innocent and and only get the guilty and all that it just takes a little bit of study and a little bit of critical thinking to see that some major changes need to be made so um yeah like you say you know you mentioned the attitude that's really step one it's for everybody, you know, and this has nothing to do with being soft on real criminals by the way right. you know I think you know, you're the, a news consumer on the same level I am. There's some horrible true crime stuff happening in your town and mine that people yep. absolutely deserve to be punished severely for. Uh, maybe too severely for you to let me on their jury, man. Some of these things uh, that that happen. So that's not really, you know, we're not talking about that. We're just talking about making sure you get the right guy and making sure that the guy who, as you said, you know, just has a broken taillight or something, doesn't end up having to lose his life waiting for a trial over some meaningless thing uh, or a joint in his pocket or whatever it is where, you know, well, I also th where the punishment too, doesn't fit the crime. Right. You know, but I, I also think so that, uh, you know, and, Maybe this is just my own personal opinion creeping in here, but I do think that on top of this, um, Americans really need to have a deep, introspective moment on what accountability means and what we're going to do about violent crime, because it is real. And there, you know, there are people who have done horrible things, horrible, horrible crimes. Um, but I think we have enough evidence from decades and decades of incarceration that simply locking them in a cell or put, putting them into prison does nothing to make us safer. It doesn't prevent people from committing these crimes. Um, and, you know, most people who commit crimes are released. Um, and we're not making ourselves any better if they've spent, you know, a decade in solitary confinement and then are let out onto the street, you know, where they haven't made eye contact with a human being in, in, in that much time. So, um, So I just think we need to sort of, dispel or, or, or just for a moment put down what we what we know and how we react to crime and violence sort of reflexively and think about if it actually works. Um, because I think that that is a big stumbling block in a lot of these conversations. You know, personally, I don't think incarceration makes us safer. And I don't think even for the most violent crimes, it is a viable solution. Um, and it does, you know, especially you know, in cases of violence or sexual assault, we wait for these crimes to happen, and then we punish people for them 
and we don't even give the victims an opportunity to play a role in their own their own prosecution trial, you know? Um, so I think we need to reassess what accountability means and reassess our approach to violent crime um, because we've been trying this, you know, we've had incarceration in this country since uh, the revolution and the Civil War, and, and it, it hasn't provided the results that we hoped it would. Right. Well, and especially, you know, when the... I don't know exactly what the proportions are, Brian. You may uh, have a lot better idea than me. But it's clear that a great proportion of violent crime is fighting over turf in drug black markets, whether it's meth or cocaine or whatever is illegal, where you can't, where, where drug businessmen can't just go into business and trade with each other. Then instead of a, you know, a, a free market competition, it's a violent battle for monopoly cartel control over territory and people die. And then people say, wow, these drugs really make people violent. We ought to stiffen the sentencing <laughs> again and, right. we, and drive and, up you know, the, the prices question. even higher. The other question is, on top of that, though, that, I, that I, I really don't think people ask is, why are people selling drugs in these communities? And why are people buying drugs in these communities? Think about what these people's lives must be like to drive you, drive you to a, a violent and dangerous and illegal lifestyle like that. I don't think anybody just wakes up and decides to be a criminal. You, you are born into an environment that either tells you you are a criminal or that sets you up to be one in order to survive. And I, and I think that, you know, again, this is not to say that people who commit violent crimes should be absolved and should not be held accountable and should be let off the hook. But I think by continuing to look at the act instead of the life that a person lives, um, we will just fall into this trap over and over again. Right. Yeah. Donald Trump keeps talking about, oh, the inner city, this, the inner city, that. Anytime any black person asks him anything, he starts talking about right. the inner city. <laughs> and, right. and the thing is, it doesn't matter if they're like a millionaire, you know, asking about buying stock in his company or what. Oh, inner city. Um, but the thing is, we already know what's wrong with the inner city. They're living inside right. a red line where poor right. people are not allowed to go into debt to own property. That's it. They're not allowed to own their own property. They're not allowed to save up capital and reinvest in improving their own property and saving their wealth. So that's why we call it a ghetto. That's what it is. It's where the government imprisons the poorest people and won't ever let them do any better. It's no different than an Indian reservation. Absolutely right. Anyway. Uh, Hey, listen, you do great work, man. And uh, this was a really great interview. I really like talking with you and I really appreciate your time. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been great. All right, y'all. That is Brian Sonnenstein. I should ask you, is it Steen or Stein? Steen. Steen. Although, okay. you know, depending on who you ask in my family. Oh, okay. Well, I won't. <laughs> I don't want to start an argument between them, but okay. All right. Thanks again, Brian. Thank you so much. Take care. All right, y'all. Brian Sonnenstein, he is at shadowproof.com. Uh, how some prisons swiftly move to undermine the national prison strike and resistance continues at historic prison strike as historic prison strike enters fourth week. Uh, those are just two of the many great articles that he has at Shadowproof. If you want to catch up and learn all about uh, this great activism, these people are suffering to bring you this information. So take it serious, you know, if you want. ScottHorton.org. For the archives, help support at scotthorton.org slash donate. Follow me on Twitter at Scott Horton Show. Thanks, guys. Hey, all Scott here. On average, how much do you think these interviews are worth to you? Of course, I've never charged for my archives in a dozen years of doing this, and I'm not about to start. But at patreon.com slash Show, you can name your own price to help support and make sure there's still new interviews to give away. So what do you think? Two bits? A buck and a half? There are usually about 80 interviews per month, I guess, so take that into account. You can also cap the amount you'd be willing to spend in case things get out of hand around here. That's patreon.com slash Scott Horton Show. And thanks, y'all. Hey, I'll check out the audiobook of Lou Rockwell's Fascism vs. Capitalism, narrated by me, Scott Horton, at audible.com. It's a great collection of his essays and speeches on the important tradition of liberty. From medieval history to the Ron Paul Revolution, Rockwell blasts our status enemies, profiles our greatest libertarian heroes, and prescribes the path forward in the battle against Leviathan. Fascism vs. Capitalism by Lou Rockwell for audiobook. Find it at Audible, Amazon, iTunes, or just click in the right margin of my website at scotthorton.org. 
You drink coffee, I drink coffee, just about everyone drinks coffee. So why bother with anything but the best? Darren's Coffee is roasted at his new shop in Claremont, Indiana. And coming soon, you can order on Amazon and support the show by using Scott Horton's affiliate link. Darren'sCoffee.com Because everyone deserves to drink great coffee.